Green plants prepare their own food by photosynthesis. Hence, they are known as autotrophs. Photosynthesis is a physiochemical process in which light is used to prepare food. Hence, it is evident that photosynthesis is the basis of food for all life on earth and it is the process that releases oxygen to the earth. We already know that chlorophyll, light, carbon dioxide and water are necessary for photosynthesis. Let us look at a few experiments that unraveled the secret of photosynthesis. Joseph Priestley, who discovered oxygen, identified the role of air in the growth of green plants. He used a bell jar and a candle in his experiment. He lit the candle and covered it with the bell jar. After some time, he observed that the candle got extinguished. He then performed a similar experiment using a mouse and a candle and observed that after some time, the mouse suffocated to death. Priestley repeated the experiment, but this time, he also placed a mint plant along with the mouse inside the bell jar. This time he observed that the mouse stayed alive and the candle burned long after he expected it to. So he concluded that the plant was able to replace the air that the mouse and candles had used up. Another scientist, Jan Ingenhaus, used the same setup as Priestley to understand the importance of sunlight to plants. He conducted the same experiment in the dark and in sunlight. He also performed this experiment with aquatic plants in bright sunlight and noticed that the small bubbles released by the green parts of the plant were oxygen. He demonstrated that only plants can release oxygen. Grana is a membranous structure responsible for trapping sunlight and involved in the production of ATP and NADPH. This is called light reaction. In the stroma, enzymatic reactions incorporating CO2 take place, leading to the production of sugar molecules. This reaction doesn't require light, but depends on the products of light reaction, ATP and NADP and hence is called dark reaction. Leaves come in many shades of green. This indicates that there are many pigments in a leaf. A chromatographical analysis of green leaves shows that these different colors are due to four pigments. Chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, xanthophylls and carotenoids. Chlorophyll A appears as bright green or blue-green in the chromatogram, whereas chlorophyll B as yellow-green, xanthophylls as yellow, and carotenoids as yellow to yellow-orange. All these pigments are involved in photosynthesis. Each pigment has the capability to absorb light at different wavelengths. If we create a graph with wavelength on the x-axis, and absorption on the y-axis, it shows that the capacity to absorb chlorophyll is between 400 and 700 nanometers, which is the visible light spectrum. The action spectrum of photosynthesis shows that maximum photosynthesis occurs in the blue and red regions of the spectrum. We find it is close to the wavelength of chlorophyll A. We can conclude that chlorophyll A is the chief pigment involved in photosynthesis. This shows that the accessory pigments chlorophyll B, carotenoids and xanthophylls also trap energy. But they transfer it to chlorophyll A. This helps the plant to utilize a wider range of wavelengths from the incident light and also protects chlorophyll A from photooxidation. Julius von Sachs in 1854 showed that glucose was formed when plants grow. He also found that the green substance chlorophyll is stored in special cells of the plant. He also proved that these green parts are the factories that produce glucose 
and it is stored as starch. T.W. Engelmann illuminated green algae cladophora with a spectrum of light using a prism. He placed the cladophora in a suspension of bacteria to pinpoint the sites that produce oxygen. The bacteria accumulated mainly in the areas of blue and red light. The first spectrum of photosynthesis was thus produced. By the middle of the 19th century, the empirical equation for photosynthesis was derived. Cornelius van Niel found that photosynthesis is a light-dependent reaction in which a hydrogen atom reduces carbon dioxide to form carbohydrates. He also inferred that H2O is the hydrogen donor which is oxidized to O2. He came to this conclusion when his experiments with sulfur bacteria released sulfur instead of O2. In that case, H2S was the donor and not water. This was later proved by radioisotopic techniques. This is how the final equation of photosynthesis was derived. Photosynthesis takes place in the chlorophyll pigments of the green leaves and stem. In the mesophyll cells, they align themselves near the walls to obtain maximum sunlight. The chloroplast consists of grana, stroma lamellae and fluid stroma. Light reactions take place during the first stage of photosynthesis. During this stage, light energy is converted into chemical energy in the form of ATP and NADPH and hence it is also called the photochemical phase. It takes place in the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast and includes photosynthetic pigments arranged into two light harvesting complexes within photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. Light harvesting systems or LHCs also called antennas are made up of many pigment molecules except a single molecule of chlorophyll A. These pigment molecules are bound to proteins and absorb different wavelengths of light and help increase the efficiency of photosynthesis. The single chlorophyll A molecule forms the reaction center in PS1 as P700 and in PS2 as P680 symbolizing the absorption maxima of chlorophyll in these centers. Light reaction consists of the following four stages. Light absorption, water splitting, release of oxygen and formation of high energy intermediates ATP and NADPH. In the light absorption stage, the chlorophyll A in PS2 absorbs the 680 nm wavelength of red light. This causes excitation of electrons, thereby attaining high energy levels. These electrons are picked up by an electron acceptor, which transfers them to the electron transport system. The electron transport system consists of cytochromes. The movement of electrons is downhill in terms of lower redox potential. The electrons from PS2 are passed on to PS1 through the electron transport system. Simultaneously, electrons of the PS1 reaction center are excited by absorbing red light of wavelength 700 nm. These are transferred to another acceptor molecule with greater redox potential. These electrons move downhill to a molecule of energy-rich NADP+, thereby reducing it to NADPH, forming a Z scheme. In water splitting, water is split into H+, oxygen atom 
and electrons. The electrons that were removed from PS2 are replaced by electrons formed due to the splitting of water. The electrons needed to replace those removed from PS1 are provided by the excited electrons of PS2 through the electron transport system. Water splitting complex is associated with PS2. The process of synthesizing high energy compounds like ATP by cells in the chloroplast and mitochondria is called phosphorylation. In non-cyclic photo, phosphorylation PS2 and PS1 work in series. These two photosystems are connected through the electron transport chain. ATP and NADPH plus are synthesized in this electron flow. The cyclic flow of electrons occurs in the stroma lamellae membrane where only PS1 is functional. This is because the lamellae membrane lacks both PS2 and the NADP reductase enzyme. The excited electrons do not pass on to NADP+, but are cycled back to the PS1 complex through the electron transport system. This cyclic flow results in the synthesis of ATP only. Cyclic photophosphorylation also occurs when only light of wavelengths beyond 680 nm are available for excitation. The chemiosmotic hypothesis explains the mechanism of ATP synthesis. ATP synthesis is linked to the development of the proton gradient across the membrane. The proton accumulates towards the inside of the thylakoid membrane in the lumen. Let's discuss the steps that help develop the proton gradient along the membrane. Water splitting takes place on the inner side of the membrane producing protons or hydrogen ions that accumulate within the lumen of the thylakoid. The movement of electrons to photosystems enables the movement of protons across the membrane. This is because the primary electron acceptor located towards the outer side of the membrane transfers its electron to H carrier. Thus a proton gets removed from the stroma while transporting an electron. When this molecule passes its electron to the electron carrier on the inner side of the membrane, the proton is released into the inner side of the membrane. The NADP reductase enzyme is located on the stroma side. The electrons that come from the acceptor of the electron of the PS1 and the protons are necessary for the reduction of NADP+. These protons are also removed from the stroma. Thus, protons in the stroma decrease in number. While in the lumen, there is an increase of protons. This creates a proton gradient across the thylakoid membrane. The breaking of the proton gradient releases energy. The ATPase enzyme present in the transmembrane channel helps in the breakdown of the proton gradient. The ATPase enzyme consists of two parts. The F0 part embedded in the membrane, forming a transmembrane channel that facilitates the diffusion of protons across the membrane. The F1 portion of ATP synthase protrudes on the outer surface of the thylakoid membrane to the side that faces the stroma. The breakdown of the gradient provides energy to cause conformation change in the F1 particle of the ATPase. This makes the ATPase enzyme synthesize several molecules of ATP. The synthesis of ATP thus requires a membrane, a proton pump, a proton gradient and the enzyme ATPase. Next, the NADPH and ATP produced by the movement of electrons are used in the Calvin cycle. So far you learned that light reaction results in the formation of ATP, NADPH 
and oxygen molecules. Now let's see how plants utilize these molecules to prepare food through the Calvin cycle. Oxygen released during photosynthesis is released into the atmosphere through stomata present on the leaves. While the ATP and NADPH molecules are used in the synthesis of carbohydrate from carbon dioxide and water. This phase is called the biosynthetic phase as it involves the production of food. It is also called dark reaction. Dark reaction takes place in the stroma of chloroplast and is not dependent on light. Dark reaction, as its name suggests, does not necessarily take place in the dark but takes place both in light and dark. Until the products of light reaction, ATP and NADPH, are exhausted. The American scientist Melvin Calvin used radioactive carbon-14 in algal photosynthesis and discovered that the first stable product formed in the biosynthetic pathway is a 3-carbon compound, 3-phosphoglycerate. However, only some plants showed 3-phosphoglycerate as the first product of carbon fixation, while others showed the formation of a 4-carbon organic acid, oxaloacetic acid. Plants that showed 3-phosphoglycerate as the first product of carbon fixation were called C3 plants and the pathway was called the C3 pathway. Plants that showed oxaloacetic acid as the first product of carbon fixation were called C4 plants and the process of carbon fixation was called the C4 pathway. Melvin Calvin, James Bassam and Andrew Benson worked out all the biochemical reactions of the C3 cycle. The C3 pathway was named after Melvin Calvin as the Calvin cycle. The Calvin cycle has three stages, carboxylation, reduction and regeneration. In carboxylation, a 5-carbon molecule, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, accepts a carbon dioxide molecule to form an intermediate 6-carbon molecule, which then splits to form two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. This reaction is catalyzed by RUBP carboxylase. Ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase also exhibits oxygenation activity. Hence, it is called ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase or simply rubisco. This phase is called carboxylation because a carbon dioxide molecule is added. In the reduction stage, a series of reactions leads to the formation of triose phosphates, which act as precursors to glucose and other sugars. At first, two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate is phosphorylated to two molecules of 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate by utilizing two molecules of ATP in the presence of the enzyme phosphoglycerate kinase. Second, the enzyme glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase reduces two molecules of 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate to two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Two molecules of NADPH are used in this reaction. Thus, to fix one molecule of carbon dioxide to two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, two ATP and two NADPH are utilized. Six carbon dioxide molecules are necessary for the formation of one glucose molecule. Hence, let's calculate for six carbon dioxide molecules. One carbon dioxide molecule results in two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecules. Hence, six molecules would yield 12 molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Of these 12 molecules, two of them are used to make one molecule of glucose. The remaining 10 glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecules 
make up a total of 30 carbon atoms. These are involved in the regeneration of 6 molecules of ribulose bisphosphate, a 5 carbon compound, thus balancing the reaction. In the regeneration phase, one ATP molecule is utilized to form one RUBP. Hence, during the Calvin cycle, one carbon dioxide molecule needs three ATP molecules and two NADPH molecules for fixation. Therefore, the net utilization of energy for the formation of one glucose molecule would be 18 ATP and 12 NADPH molecules. So far, you have learnt about the Calvin cycle in C3 plants, where 3 PGA is the first product of carboxylation. Let's now study carbon fixation in plants that have the first product of the Calvin cycle as a 4 carbon compound. These plants are called C4 plants, and the process of carbon fixation is called the C4 pathway. The C4 pathway was discovered by M.D. Hatch and C.R. Slack in 1966. Hence, it is also called the Hatch and Slack pathway. Carbon fixation in C4 differs from C3 plants as it has one extra step preceding the C3 Calvin cycle. C4 plants are found in hot and dry areas and are adapted to tolerate high temperatures and can respond to high light intensities. The transverse section of C4 leaves such as maize shows a specialized arrangement of cells around the vascular bundles called the bundle sheath on the inner side. They are closely arranged and are without intercellular spaces. These cells contain many chloroplasts and have thick walls made of suberin which makes them impervious to gases. The outer side of the vascular bundles contains mesophyll cells with chloroplasts. The large number of chloroplasts in the bundle sheath cells surrounding the vascular bundles makes the vein appear dark green. Leaves whose anatomy shows vascular bundles encircled by bundle sheath cells are called leaves with Kranz anatomy. Kranz is derived from a German word which means halo or wreath. Examples of plants exhibiting Kranz anatomy are maize and sugarcane. In the C4 pathway, carbon dioxide is fixed in the mesophyll cells. The first step is the conversion of pyruvate to phosphoenol pyruvate by utilizing one molecule of ATP in the presence of the enzyme pyruvate phosphate dikinase. Phosphoenol pyruvate, a three carbon compound, accepts carbon dioxide to form oxaloacetate, a four carbon compound. This reaction is catalyzed by phosphoenol pyruvate carboxylase. This enzyme ensures carboxylation even at low concentrations of carbon dioxide because of its greater affinity towards carbon dioxide compared to Rubisco. Rubisco is absent in the mesophyll cells of C4 plants. Oxaloacetate is quickly converted to either malate or aspartate and is transported to the bundle sheath cells through plasma desmata, where it is decarboxylated back to pyruvate. Decarboxylation results in the release of a carbon dioxide molecule. Pyruvate is transported back to the mesophyll cells through plasma desmata and is phosphorylated to phosphoenol pyruvate. Then the cycle of carboxylation is reinitiated. The released carbon dioxide is fixed in bundle sheath cells, which are rich in rubisco, through the Calvin or C3 cycle. Thus we find that 
C4 plants undergo carboxylation twice. That is, in mesophyll, through the C4 cycle, and in bundle sheath cells via the Calvin cycle. In C4 plants, the C4 and C3 pathways are separated in space as they occur in different cells, that is, mesophyll cells and bundle sheath cells. As per energy requirements, the C4 pathway is a little expensive compared to the C3 pathway. This is because the C4 pathway consumes two ATP molecules for every carbon dioxide molecule fixed. Therefore, fixation of six molecules of CO2 requires 12 ATP molecules. When we include the ATPs used in the Calvin cycle to the total ATPs used, the count goes up to 30, which are 12 more than in the C3 pathway. Though the C4 pathway is quite expensive, it is an efficient method of carbon fixation for plants living in hot and dry conditions. Photorespiration is a process that lowers the efficiency of photosynthesis in plants. In this process, ribulose bisphosphate, or RUBP, reacts with oxygen to release carbon dioxide. This happens during the Calvin cycle due to the catalytic activity of RUBP oxygenase. Interestingly, though Rubisco shows greater affinity towards carbon dioxide than oxygen, it can bind with both molecules. However, this binding is determined by the relative concentration of these gases at the enzyme site of the plant cells. Photorespiration occurs in C3 plants because some oxygen is likely to bind with Rubisco during photosynthesis. But C4 plants with its special leaf anatomy have evolved to overcome this process. In C3 plants, photorespiration is pronounced especially during dry conditions and in high temperatures when the concentration of carbon dioxide is lowered in the leaf. This is due to its utilization in the Calvin cycle after the closure of stomata to check transpiration. During photorespiration, the active site of Rubisco combines with oxygen and yields one molecule of phosphoglycerate and one molecule of phosphoglycolate, while with carbon dioxide, it yields two molecules of phosphoglycerate. Though phosphoglycerate enters the Calvin cycle and is recycled to form RUBP, phosphoglycolate is removed from the chloroplast. In these plants, oxygen binds with Rubisco during photosynthesis, which results in reduced carbon dioxide fixation. Additionally, this process does not result in the synthesis of sugars nor of ATP or NADPH. However, it utilizes energy in the form of ATP. Photorespiration is thus a wasteful process in C3 plants. However, in C4 plants, photorespiration does not occur due to the special leaf anatomy found in these plants. Moreover, Rubisco is absent in the mesophyll cells of C4 plants. However, they have an efficient enzyme in the mesophyll cells called PEP carboxylase, which catalyzes the carboxylation reaction. In this reaction, pyruvate accepts the carbon dioxide molecule and forms 4-carbon acid. The 4-carbon acid is carried to the bundle sheath cells to release carbon dioxide, where it enters the Calvin cycle. The thick walls of the bundle sheath cells, being impervious to gaseous exchange, also aid in maximizing the concentration of carbon dioxide near Rubisco. Therefore, the oxygenase activity of Rubisco is minimized or barely present.
As the C4 plants succeed in bypassing the photorespiratory pathway, photosynthesis proves to be more productive, which ultimately increases their yield. The yield of a plant is determined by photosynthesis, a physiochemical process influenced by several internal and external factors. Internal factors, also known as plant factors, are determined by the plant's genetic makeup and its growth. Factors such as the number, size, age and orientation of the leaves, mesophyll cells, chloroplasts, internal CO2 concentration, and the amount of chlorophyll are the internal factors that affect photosynthesis. External factors, on the other hand, include the availability of sunlight, light intensity, incident light, temperature, carbon dioxide concentration, and water. Initially, scientists assumed that only an increase in CO2 absorption by the leaves during photosynthesis increased the rate of assimilation leading to increased plant growth. This opinion underwent a change when experiments conducted by Frederick Blackman showed that photosynthesis is affected by other external factors as well. In fact, Blackman formulated the law of limiting factors which states that if a chemical process is affected by more than one factor then its rate will be determined by the factor which is nearest to its minimal value. It is the factor which directly affects the process if its quantity is changed. In other words, this law means that though photosynthesis is dependent on several factors, the rate at which the process takes place is governed by the factor whose concentration is the lowest. A typical plant, for instance, is capable of utilizing 0.05% of atmospheric CO2 while photosynthesizing at an optimum light intensity. However, if only 0.01% of CO2 is available for the plant, then the rate of photosynthesis is limited by CO2 concentration. Upon increasing the CO2 concentration, the photosynthetic rate also keeps increasing. However, if CO2 concentration is increased beyond 0.05%, the photosynthesis rate remains unaffected because other factors such as light intensity and water become limiting. Similarly, at low light intensity, incident light and the rate of photosynthesis are linearly related, which means an increase in incident light causes a corresponding increase in the photosynthesis rate. However, after reaching the light saturation point, which is normally 10% of full sunlight, the photosynthesis rate does not show any further increase. Did you know that an increase in incident light beyond the saturation point causes a breakdown of chlorophyll, which in turn can drastically reduce the photosynthetic rate in plants? Apart from light, carbon dioxide whose atmospheric concentration varies between 0.03 and 0.04% too affects the photosynthetic rate in both C3 and C4 plants. However, under varying light intensity, C3 and C4 plants respond differently to the carbon dioxide concentration. When light intensity is low, an increase in carbon dioxide concentration does not increase the photosynthesis rate in either group of plants. However, at high light intensity, both C3 and C4 plants show an increase in the rate of photosynthesis. However, C4 plants attain saturation at 360 microliters per liter and don't show any further increase in the rate of photosynthesis. C3 plants, on the other hand, show saturation only beyond 450 microliters per liter. The difference in saturation points means 
that the current atmospheric CO2 concentration becomes a limiting factor only for C4 plants. This fact is utilized by large-scale farmers who grow crops such as tomatoes in a greenhouse, where the carbon dioxide rich atmosphere helps increase the crop yield. Apart from light and CO2 concentration, the rate of photosynthesis is also affected by temperature. In fact, temperature has a major influence on light and dark reactions. Temperature also affects C3 and C4 plants. When C4 plants, whose optimum temperature is 35 degrees Celsius, are subjected to higher temperatures, they register a greater increase in the rate of photosynthesis than their C3 counterparts, whose optimum temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. Similarly, the rate of photosynthesis of tropical plants remains unaffected by higher temperatures, whereas an increase in temperature causes a decrease in the photosynthetic rate of temperate plants as they have a lower optimum temperature than tropical plants. Water is another factor that affects the photosynthetic rate of a plant. However, water is an indirect factor as it affects the plant rather than photosynthesis itself. Water stress caused by lack of sufficient water forces the stomata to close, which automatically means less carbon dioxide for plants. Moreover, water stress causes the leaves to wilt, which reduces their surface area and affects photosynthesis. It is thus important that water and all the other factors are available at optimum levels as this will ensure a healthy rate of photosynthesis, which in turn, will increase plant yield.